Hey, welcome back to your 8th favorite clone of your 3rd favorite YouTuber. Today I'm going to show you some weird trends from history, starting off with x-rays. When the x-ray was discovered in 1895, people had Pokemon Go levels of hype. Since they thought x-rays were some type of miracle cure, crude machines started popping up everywhere. Nobody knew about the radiation or its side effects, so these machines were used in really dumb ways. If you had acne, warts, or maybe just a weird looking birthmark, you might end up with x-rays blasted at your face with no protection. If that doesn't sound pleasant, it's because it's not. Radiation exposure was very hit or miss, and patients often got severe burns, and later, various types of cancer. This didn't stop the hype train though, because it made its way to women's hair removal. In the 1940s, when dresses got shorter and birth rates got higher, women's body hair fell out of fashion. As expected, a razor was the most common way of turning Bigfoot into your grandma, but x-rays were used for a short time before the radiation burns turned women away. But just like doctors in the early 1900s, we don't care, because there's an even dumber use of x-rays. The shoe-fitting fluoroscope, or as they were called in the land of bad weather and worse food, the pedoscope. These machines were marketed mostly at mothers and their children, and were a common item in shoe stores from the 1930s up until the 70s. They had a hole at the bottom for your feet, where the user would stand between an x-ray bulb and a fluorescent screen. A salesman would then press a button to start the radiation and take a live view of your feet, along with you and your mother. Now if your IQ is above room temperature, you probably know standing on top of an x-ray bulb is a bad idea, but it gets worse. These machines were just made of wood, and the only protection for your feet was a 1mm thick piece of aluminum, which didn't stop the rays from scattering. So that means if you were just chilling, shopping for shoes, and some little dumbass was button mashing in the corner, you got hit with the radiation too. Because of this McAfee-esque protection, it should be no surprise that the biggest impact came to the salesmen, since they had to stand next to the machines and stare at people's dogs all day. What I did find surprising though is that despite indiscriminately pumping out high amounts of radiation for 40 years, these machines are only linked to three confirmed injuries. Not bad. One saleswoman got eczema on her hand from reaching into the machine and grabbing at people's grippers. Another got skin cancer on the bottom of their foot and the most serious injury was a shoe model who had to have her whole leg lopped off because of radiation burns. There's also some concern of an increase in youth ball cancer, since kids are more radiosensitive and their gonads would have been right in the path of the rays. Nobody back in the day cared enough to check though, so who knows. Moving on to something a bit lighter than child cancer, let's talk about Vore. In 1939, goldfish gulping, or the act of gulping a goldfish, became a popular trend at colleges throughout the United States, even turning into a competition between schools and like any good college trend, it all started off with a dare. Lothrop Withington Jr., crazy name by the way, was a Harvard student who once told his buddies he'd swallowed a live goldfish. They didn't believe him, so they bet him 10 bucks he couldn't do it again. And since Lothrop was a man of his word, he took the bet and spent a couple days practicing by swallowing smaller goldfish and tadpoles before the official day came. When it was time, a crowd of students and reporters gathered at the campus and watched in anticipation. I feel like there were more important things to report on in 1939, but whatever. Lothrop grabbed the poor fish, dropped it in his mouth, chewed it a little bit, and then gulped it down with relative ease. The press then published the story, and the competition to vore the most goldfish was on. Three weeks after the first one was swallowed, the record was raised to three, and just a couple days later it jumped way up to 24. And with this fierce competition, the young savants of America's finest schools quickly came up with new techniques for swallowing, some of which are still in use by your mother. Some people chase the fish with milk, some chose mashed potatoes or ketchup, and others just went raw. These brave souls eventually pushed the boundary of goldfish gulping to an official record of 89 and an unofficial one of 101. But like all trends, it eventually had to die, and this one was gone by the end of the year because A, swallowing more than 89 was genuinely hard to do, and B, people felt bad for the goldfish. Protesters started showing up at new record attempts, and soon after, a bill to stop voring fish was put forward in Massachusetts. Just in case I've inspired you, you should know goldfish gulping is illegal in most countries. Back in 2014, a guy was fined 200 pounds and banned from owning animals for a year after he posted a video of him swallowing two goldfish. These ones actually survived though, because he threw them up in his toilet. If you want to find out more about the history of swallowing goldfish, don't make the same mistake I did by going to goldfishswallowing.com. On the opposite end of the vor spectrum, we have the Victorian trend of fasting girls. Now despite the name, these girls weren't known for their speed, but rather their claims of not needing food. Some girls said they had survived for weeks or months without eating, but the more ambitious ones claimed they'd gone years. Their supporters believed their survival without nourishment was a sign of holy intervention, which meant the girls had mystical powers. Therese Newman was probably the most successful fasting girl, as she was never proven to be a fake. 
1918, Therese fell off a stool and somehow ended up partially paralyzed. And from here, a pattern started where she would injure herself, claim to see visions of God, and then miraculously be cured of her injury. At one point, she claimed to have her blindness cured after a vision, but got called out because while supposedly blind, doctors noticed her eyes responded normally to light. Because of her shadiness, a lot of people thought she was a fake, but there was no hard evidence. So in 1927, in an effort to catch her out, she was put on medical watch for 15 days. None of the nurses saw her eat anything, and her weight dropped by 9 pounds. But right before the end of it, she went back up to normal, so she was probably sneaking food while the nurses were busy. Most people were still suspicious, but she refused to take another test, and stuck with her story till she died 35 years later. Another fasting girl, named Sarah Jacob, had a much worse time starving herself because it eventually led to her death. In 1867, when she was 10 years old, she fell into a month-long coma after getting an unknown illness, and apparently, six months after waking up, she had stopped eating entirely. And I guess her parents realized they could make money by leaning into the divine miracle angle because they encouraged the public to come and visit Sarah at home and leave donations. Now the scam worked for a while, but by 1869 people were getting suspicious, so her parents agreed to put her under a strict medical watch, which did not go well. Only a couple days into the study, and Sarah was starting to look like ass, so the doctors told her parents to call it off, but they were like, eh, that's just how she is sometimes. They ended up being wrong though, because on the eighth day, Sarah starved to death, and since they refused to give her food, they were charged with manslaughter. In 1881, the same thing happened to another fasting girl named Lenora Eaton who starved to death after 45 days of Lenora not eaten. While there's surprisingly many more cases of dead fasting girls, I think the worst loss suffered was to Josephine Bedard's pride when she was called out for having a half-eaten donut in her pocket and stealing food off a doctor's plate. The last fasting girl I want to talk about is my favorite one, Anne Moore, who was more of a fasting woman since she hopped on the trend when she was 46. I like Anne because she had the coolest ways of sneaking food while under study. Her first method was to have her daughter put towels soaked with broth over her mouth so she could suck up the nutrients. But her best way was to just have her kid vomit into her mouth mama bird style and disguise it as a kiss. And while fasting girls aren't a common trend anymore, their spirit lives on in people called breatharians who claim to only need the sun and air for nourishment. And that's the last trend for this video. I just want to say since we hit a thousand subscribers, I made an Instagram to celebrate. So go check that out. Only fans coming at 10,000. So like and subscribe. Also, I want to give a quick shout out to my fellow creators on screen. If you're interested, you should check them out too. So with that said, that's the end of today's video. I'm Sad Catman, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.